today we are very happy to have Xiaolang Chi, who will be telling us about bulk reconstruction from generalized free fields. And before we start, let me invite you all uh, to dinner. So we're planning to go to dinner with Xiaolang, and we are departing from here at about 6.30. So if you're interested in coming, please send me an email. Thanks. Um, thanks, Juan, very much uh, for hosting me. Uh, uh, um, so um, today I will talk about some ongoing work that um, um, I'm uh, working in collaboration with uh, my students, Tamara and Ibabu. And, and uh, this is about um, some uh, way to construct the um, bulk um, theory from the boundary uh, generalized free fields, um, which we try to do it in a way that's a bit more general than before. Um, some of you may have heard uh, Tamara's talk uh, last December here at the Ifram Trivial Workshop. Um, so sorry if it's re re repeating some of that. Uh, so, um, so the outline is, I will start, I don't think I need a much uh, overview for this uh, audience, uh, but um, I will explain what is, the, um, what, is what we are trying to do at, uh, as uh, uh, this construction uh, starting from generalized free fields and then, uh, then using the example of XIP model as a, a generalized free field, uh, we uh, will study like what uh, we can see uh, at, uh, about bulk dynamics from this, uh, um, uh, this construction. And then I will discuss some uh, other uh, ongoing directions, like going to other geometries like the Caesar space. Um, so feel free to interrupt me if you don't have any questions. Um, so, Maybe it's better to look at here. Uh, so, um, um, so we, um, so the, the key. I mean, I, I don't think I need an overview about holographic duality. Um, um, but so, I think the main question that's motivating this work is how general is this uh, duality? And so, like when we think about. And there is a many body system where different states have different have uh, dual uh, geometry, uh, which are um, um, kind of different semi classical geometry, for example. Um, how general are these kind of uh, pictures? Are they um, specific to um, uh, some uh, areas uh, with supersymmetry, or is it more, um, uh, more general phenomena in quantum many body physics? So that's uh, what I what I hope to see like what part of this kind of um, um, this duality between quantum between quantum many body system and um, um, and the the um, the quantum gravity can be generalized to a generic quantum many body system. So before going to details, I actually because I was a condensed matter uh, physicist uh, by training, so I would like to make a comparison. Um, I feel like. Um, I guess this thing doesn't really show up on the screen. So uh, I, I, uh, I feel like if you compare holographic duality with uh, uh, like PCS theory of superconductor, which is like the typical, like this. The uh, physical point of holography. Oh, yeah, thanks. That's great. So, um, so like the, in the case of uh, superconductivity theory, we have some phenomenological understanding and we have some macroscopic understanding behind the phenomenological theories, right? So, so like there is a effective field theory, which is in the Landau theory, which I think is kind of like a semi classical gravity uh, and where the other parameter, like the super mapping other parameter, uh, which becomes classical in the, in a macroscopic super nuclear, that's like, a, like the geometry itself. And right? like it's, it's a, um, generically it's quantum, but in this limit, it becomes a classical field, and then there is fluctuation around it, which is like graviton, which is in the superconductor case. Uh, well, in the superfluid case, it's like ghost homos. The superconductor has charge, so there is the Higgs mechanism. Of it. Here, when I say superconductor, I'm just thinking about it as like this, like the electron pair superfluid. So, uh, so then what is really what is missing is like the analog of BCS theory. Right? It's like the macroscopic theory, which you can start from there and derive. Is uh, this uh, um, effective um, effective descriptions which are played by which are like the semi classical gravities and uh, 
And, and by the way, and the analog of like in the simulator, actually you have this other parameter, and the other parameter can fluctuate, and that's like post normal. But on top of that, you also have the fermion. So the fermion leaves in that background, interact with that with that other parameter. So that's like the other parameter. And and in in the holography, there is also a matter field. So so I think that well, we don't know how much how to do that, but but maybe the first step is like deriving some. Like, like doing like the mean field level. So like we're, we're trying to do some kind of uh, mean field theory version uh, uh, of the, uh, the duality, which means we, uh, we, we get some uh, like free particle living on the background, but at least uh, now, at least uh, we hope to do that in the most general possible way. Um, so, so the starting point of our uh, construction is uh, uh, the well-known uh, of HKL, uh, where they show uh, that if you, I think the original work was in um, ADS vacuum. So if you have this uh, field in ADS vacuum, then um, using the equation of motion, you can derive a relation between the boundary condition of the field uh, in this way and uh, between the boundary condition of the field here and uh, the field value here. So then you can express that as a linear equation. And, and then because the boundary condition determines the boundary operators, so you can view this as a reconstruction of the boundary, uh, starting from the, the boundary operator, you can write down the bulk field um, as a function of that. Uh, so what, the, uh, what we are going to do is, is some, um, something quite similar to this, but there is some logical um, difference, which is uh, we want to say, if we don't assume there is a equation of motion, we know. If we don't know anything about the bulk equation of motion, what can we, uh, uh, whether can we start from purely boundary data and do this, uh, this reconstruction? So the take home message um, will be, um, we start from this boundary two point function. So say in the simplest case, which will be mainly what I will talk about, in the simplest case, it's just a, a time, right? Let's say, think about zero plus one to one plus one. So we start from a, a system in zero spatial dimensions, so just time. Then um, we can think about four bosons or fermions, but uh, because our example is the SRK model, so I will be using fermions. So this is some Majorana fermions. And then you start with this two point function of the Majorana fermions. And uh, uh, we start from that data and knowing it's a generalized free field, which means it satisfies a weak theorem. Then we try to we construct um, a bulk theory. And the way we do it is uh, by first discretizing time. And then in the discrete time, uh, the bulk theory is a quantum circuit, where the, the, there is a bulk fermion moving in that quantum circuit, which will produce the same uh, two point function. And the interesting thing is that this whole theory is totally determined by this boundary data. Any questions? Okay, so um, so 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 generalized free field. I I, uh, I just mean uh, the the fields that set that correlation function satisfies weak theorem. So a more formal way of saying that is if I introduce a source term for that field and integrate out the the uh, the chi uh, action, then I get uh, a Gaussian uh, generated. Sorry, this is eta here. Um, I get a generating function that's Gaussian, and the other non Gaussian terms are sub leading. So um, that's the theory. Uh, so so when, when, whenever I have that, then the chi correlation function will satisfy the weak theorem. So uh, all the higher point functions will be determined by two point function. But this doesn't mean um, the, the action, doesn't mean the chi is a free theory. So you can have, so the example is the, like SLK model, which we will um, briefly overview. So uh, you can have a key point is that you can have interacting system um, where you where, where it, um, you still have uh, weak theorem. And so um, we know SYK model describes um, some zero plus one um, theory where you have n fermions interacting with each other. And then uh, there is this random coupling and after you average over the randomness, you get this uh, uh, large n limit where the two point function is given by the string Dyson equation. And the, importantly, the four point functions are suppressed by one over n. So if you consider the theory in uh, large n limit, 
then um, there is this uh, um, generalized, uh, so the, the chi, chi fermion field becomes the generalized free field, and all the coordinate functions are determined by the two point function. And the two point function itself is obtained by solving the Sumerian equation. And um, um, so, so one, one thing we will start with is, uh, uh, for example, the simple fact that if you consider a, a, a two-point function in the thermal state, it will decay exponentially. And so you get this uh, this two-point function of I. So I came out, which is diagonal in the in the fermion label I, and uh, and it decays exponentially uh, in time. Um, and at low temperature, we know uh, the dual it, the as I can the the dual, which is the JT gravity. Um, and but in this, uh, in this work, we will be working on a striking model with general temperature. So one thing we need, we want, I want to clar clarify is the fact that a striking model has this large end solution and the, the um, generalized free field, these have nothing to do with the low temperature limit. And so this, this by itself doesn't tell us the model has a dual, <coughs> a dual in, the, in the ordinary sense. So because I find the temperature, this model doesn't have this emergent conformal symmetry. So it's it, it, so so it could be very far from the conformal limit. And so so the the requirement that you have generalized free field is separate from um, the conformal symmetry. Um, so okay. So now let me describe what um, we what we uh, propose to do. Uh, so this construction here. Is not specific to SYK. It's a we're using SYK as an example for a model with generalized free field. So for any model with a generalized free field, we want to start by considering this quantity. And so we have coordinate functions in real time. We can consider commutator or anti-commutators. But let's start from the anti-commutator of the fermion at two different times. So um, so for a second model, you'll get some something that's a better function in IJ, but that's not so important. So, so in general, let's consider this matrix here. And so, so um, um, if you compare, so you ask, okay, what's the key difference between a model with generalized free field and a model with a free field? So, for example, if you have another theory which is just free from you, you have a Hamiltonian and that's bilinear. Then what happens is this anti-commutator will be extracting the um, single particle time evolution matrix. If, if you have a free, like a quadratic Hamiltonian, the time evolution of chi will be just linear superposition of, of chi. So, so then, then that means if you take an anti-commutator of fermion at a different time, you just get the transformation between them, which is a unitary operator. And for, for Marana, it's an orthogonal operator. So this is the, the, the key difference that tells us something, that tells us that um, once this anti-commutator matrix is not unitary, like this thing will decay in time, so it's not unitary. Uh, once this anti-commutator matrix is not unitary, it tells me um, some information goes missing in time evolution. Some information disappeared from the single particle time. That's what the uh, physical it means. It means the single particle state evolves to multi-particle states. So the chance it stays single particle becomes smaller than one. Um, and that's the key difference between these. And that's the key observation that will allow us to, um, to construct the spot fermion from the boundary fermion once you have this kind of <coughs> linear independent fermion at different time. Um, is it important here you have a black hole? Uh, if you had something like ADS without the black hole, then it would be. In the uh, no, uh, if you take zero temperature limit of SYK, <coughs> this uh, matrix is decay with power law, um, but the same thing is still true. Like the chi i's, the states, basically the, the operators at time t and operator at time t prime, they are linearly independent. To make them dependent, you could take n equals four super angles below the arcing page temperature, and then you'd have a unitary transformation. Uh, what you're uh, saying is amounts to the fact that even at zero temperature, the SYK model doesn't isn't below a Hawking page transition. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, in the case of uh, Sylvia Uh 
like on the boundary, well, I think that what in the higher dimensional case, what we can say is any field with anomalous dimension uh, still satisfies this condition. If you have a field which doesn't have anomalous dimension, then it's like this. It's like it, it lives in this dimension. Have the interesting between the free field and the boundary. And the field. Yeah, yeah. So you you have a yeah. Here I'm talking about the, this on the boundary. Like even in super I would like uh, I would guess it's so if you have a, in the boundary CFT you have an operator that has an anomalous dimension then that should correspond to not something with a unitary like Hamiltonian on the boundary. I'm not sure because there's a nice Hilbert space in which the evolution is prime. There is a when you include when you include the interaction, yeah, so like uh, the that's why it has a well defined Hamiltonian. And it was formed below the working page temperature. Well, yeah. well, what I mean is like you have the boundary, and then yeah, so in the dual picture you have the bulk, and then the the whole point here is saying. If you don't have, if you just look at the field in the boundary, although they, they are generalized free fields, they satisfy weak theorem. Um, um, if I look at, if I look at how, how like if for boson I will be commutator for fermions and the commutator, if I look at this, um, I expect generally this this uh, linear map between states here and here is not unitary because so so the interpretation on the boundary why this is not unitary is that single particle states will become multi-particle. And the interpretation in the bulk is there is a bulk. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Like we're saying, anytime this happens because of the interaction, you can trade that by putting it in effective bulk. And that bulk is basically determined by this property. Okay, maybe I will, maybe it will be more clear uh, when I describe what to be. For example, below yeah. locking a temperature, uh -huh. I don't think the two point function falls off at of t minus t prime with plus signs because it comes from the discrete spectrum of the four. It's considering um, relatively short time. Short time. Like if I have a, I'm less than the radius. Less than the size of the sphere. Okay. Uh, why the, but, but I could have the boundary to be in a yet plane. Yeah. Then, then, do, I, then do I still need to consider yes. short but, time? No, no, but there you don't have this. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be short compared with ADS readers. Really. Sorry, short compared to the size of the sphere. Okay, so um, yeah, so so basically, what we say is that if you leave on the boundary and you can only measure the two-point function, you would have thought this particle goes away somewhere, goes to somewhere else because the Zanet parameter is small. And then um, then okay, it's not surprising that I tell you you can always make this uh, one higher dimensional theory and say uh, um, this the reason why we are talking about this. Well, I don't know how to do it in, in continuous time. So that's why we're discretizing time. So let's say in the SYK model, the correlation function you can compute for any time, the time is continuous. But let's say now I only focus on the correlation function where t t prime t t prime at some discrete value. Let's say I only look at the, the at the commutator at the, these times. So then uh, in that case, I will tell you, okay, you can make a quantum circuit in one plus one dimension. The quantum circuit is Gaussian, which means it's totally just a free fermion evolution. You can make the, you can design the gates so that the two point function of this bulk fermion is the same at the boundary. So you have a two part, you have a bulk fermion per size ZT, which, uh, which lives on the links, you lives on the links, and then they, they interact with each other. These gates are Gaussian. It means that they are just doing linear transformations, unitary transformations to the fermions. And then uh, now, if you calculate the side side correlator uh, at the z equal to zero line, and this is uh, to clarify, this is not a gate. This is just identity. I'm just putting the point here to tell you where are the boundary. So this is a this is semi-infinite circuit. The circuit is semi-infinite, and then here is just this line and this line are the same. It's just identity. 
And these, these are purple and blue are gates. Okay, so it's not surprising that you can design the gates so that so that the two-point function looks exactly the same as what you get from my circuit board, right? I mean, if you count the number of parameters, you have enough number of parameters to do that. Um, it's a little, it's, at least it's surprising to me was uh, you can actually totally determine the, all the gates by, by, by this A matrix on the boundary. Um, if you think a little more, it's also not so surprising because <laughs> the number of parameter counting works. Uh, uh, but the, um, um, this is a, um, this is a, um, a little special because like if I tell you a correlation function, let's say if I have a fermion state, I tell you the correlation function along the line, that's not going to determine correlation function later because you have to tell me what are the gates. But the special thing is like, if you do this in the time direction, then you only need to do to know this line. And you and I, and the other condition I need to tell you is these gates are unitary. But I don't need to tell you what are the gates. But now you know they're unitary, Gaussian, then uh, they can be determined. AFTT prime is supposed to be any function? Uh, AFTT prime, uh, it can be any function. And the only condition that this procedure works is, uh, well, it's a symmetric function. It's a symmetric okay. function. Uh, the only con condition this works is a, and the matrix has a non zero determinant. Um, Since you're trying to prescribe space of A's, well, you pass on A to be positive definite. Oh, yeah, it is positive definite. Uh, right, yeah. Since, you're trying, since the space of positive definite A's is contractible, and the space of unitary operators has a lot of topology, it's very surprising if you can uniquely parameterize one by the other. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, the unitary is. Uh, maybe that's uh, because. Yeah, I'm not sure how to how to think about that. But the unitary is. I mean, there's some gauge degree of freedom that I can change the unitary is, uh, but preserving the whole. Oh, you need to read. Okay, so maybe maybe that will be more clear when I tell you exactly what we did, which reduced to a very simple math problem. So QR decomposition. So 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 like what we are doing? We're we're saying we're looking for linear transformation that takes my boundary fermion to the bulk fermions, and with the condition that the bulk fermions are canonical, that they have to have the canonical anti-commutation relation. So. If you take Psi here and here, as long as they are space like separated, the anti commutator should be zero. So, so, so the anti commutator matrix is identity. So, really, what you're doing is you're looking for a matrix K, which satisfies K. Oh, sorry, this is A. I'm sorry. This, this G is A. Sorry. Uh, I'm changing notation. So, K A, K dagger is what? The A was this anti commutator matrix of Chi. So, for a given A, for a given anti commutator matrix, I'm just I'm just finding k so that k a k dagger is one with the condition that k because because we want something like a HPLL kernel where like this fermion will only depend on fermions in this window like this fermion will only depend on fermion in this window right? so you have this complex so far and that translates to the statement that your k has some triangular form so really you're just looking for a triangular matrix satisfying this equation. Is G your two point function? Yeah, sorry. Uh, that's the, a a. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was saying. I, 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 I changed the G to A and I forgot to change this one. Yeah, this is the. Uh, maybe I should write it here. Okay, hey, hey, hey. Let's use transpose because everything is real here. Yeah, so you're just looking for something like that and uh, A is a positive. Yeah, so you see it, it must be, uh, it's only possible if A is positive definite. Yeah. So for A is positive definite. Um, uh, I can always find a K which satisfies this. And then uh, also the uh, uh, K, uh, this triangular form, let me explain. So, so this shape of the matrix will depend on uh, where you define your block fermions. Like I could define the block fermions along a spatial line. I could also define it uh, along the light like line. Uh, as long as it's, uh, it's not Time lag, that's fine. So, so then um, if you do it along this time lag, like future light home, 
then it has the simplest uh, form. Like the first one is just the boundary from the MSL. And the second one is the linear superposition of these two, which is required to be orthogonal with that one. So that's like this here. And then the third one is like has three entries. So it's really just the triangular form. And the reason why it's this shape is just um, we are ordering boundary time like this, and we are ordering the block fermions this way. So, so it looks like that triangular rather than this one. But anyway, it's just uh, mathematically it's very simple, just doing QRD composition. I don't know how to address that uh, and uh, comments about the topology. But, uh, but basically, um, what you're doing is you take uh, this, you take K, sorry, you take T minus one half, and then do a QRD composition, which means Q is the orthogonal matrix and K is the triangular matrix. And then, uh, so that, uh, uh, that's not the, Q, the Q is not the unitary gaze I'm talking about. But this, this, we haven't got the K gate yet. What we get is this transformation from about the boundary. That, but that guarantee you that once I define this, this mapping K, that determines all the gates in the bulk. Because, um, because by construction, the fermions here, let's say, look at the gate, the input and the output, they, they both satisfy the canonical and the comedy relations. So by construction, this gate preserves this uh, and the competent relation. So, so I didn't require the case to be unitary. Well, I, I required this, which is equivalent to require all the case to be unitary. So, so you can just take this and then extract the case. So you take this. Oh, um, so, sorry, could you go back? Mm -hmm. What is, can you remind us what's unitary and what's K? G is the same as A, which is unitary. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, no, G is the positive dominant matrix, which is an anti commutator between under the Which one is this? Which one is unitary? Uh, so Q, Q is unitary. But that, that's not the. But before A was unitary, wasn't it? No, A wasn't unitary. I, I, so I'm sorry for the. For the uh, I can just change that. G is A. A is this. Uh, so, so just to clarify, um, A. A is a matrix with the time as entries. So pi T. In general, there could be flavors, but we can, let's for a simple SYK model, there's only one flavor. <laughs> and then um, you compute this, let's say, in some state, let's say it's thermal state of SYK, uh, for example, then you get this metric. And that's not unitary. It's not unitary. And then what, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is that you, you define the bulk fermion this way, and then now you know the definition of bulk fermion. So the bulk fermion here, I know it's some linear superposition of these. And this one is some linear superposition of these four. Okay? And this one, this one, right? So I know the, the input and output of each bulk gate. And from that, I can determine what is that gate. Can I think of K as, a, as an operator of the model space? Uh, it's, it's not really a, it's, it's a linear map between two bases of operators. It's a linear map between two bases, but that's that's an operator between bases. So you could certainly write down an operator corresponds to that, which won't be because the transformation itself is not unitary. So it's not a it's it's not a unitary operator. Yeah, it doesn't have to be unitary, but it's certainly an operator, right? <coughs> uh, I think it's not or something, but not on the number space of the theory, if that's what you want. It's an operator, but I think you can write it in the way like psi equals to chi times something. <clears throat> like, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to do that because like you don't, you don't want to write something like I have an operator which do this. This will preserve the under commutative relation. Right? So this will, will not work. Because I, I want to find that. So, so you can you can think of as I add some operator in my so so really what I'm doing is I'm taking this chi i t with different time t mm -hmm. and then I'm doing some linear superposition. So you map the different time and space. We map them to psi psi a different dt. And there is a label like left or right over. What I'm saying is, if you take larger than limit, these satisfy the fermion and the commutator relation. 
It seems like it's mapping from a space of fermions to a, to a space of different fermions, maybe. So I think it's better to see that, yeah, it's mapping from, maybe, it's, maybe you can see that it's mapping from the Hilbert space of the SYK, the boundaries, to, to the Hilbert space of the Bach fermion. Where this is not the actual Hilbert space of the actual like quantum gravity theory. This is like effective, like Bach fermion living everywhere. So it's a much bigger space. But there is a mapping from here to here. But and maybe you can think of the, the, the target Hilbert space is also living in the boundary space. It's you're defining the a subspace of the boundary Hilbert space. That's the one like mushrooms. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's like if I focus on if I take large N limit and focus on all that, it's finite number. Then uh, there is a one to one map between that part of the Hilbert space and that part of the fermion Hilbert space. Uh, I will come back to that point later. But, but just to clarify what I was trying to say here, just this, there is this point about the case. Like, because we know the kernel, then we know how to express the bulk fermions, the input, the blue one, or the input of the case. I, I, I can write down these as linear superposition of the boundary fermion, and I can write down the yellow ones also as linear superposition of the boundary fermion. So, so, so that determines what is this gate, which is a single particle transformation. So in the simple case here, where I only have one flavor of fermion at every link, uh, the, the transformation is just a two by two matrix. So there is only one parameter, which is the, the gate angle. So I'm taking these two, the blue fermions, and then hybridize them and couple them, taking linear serialization by this uh, two by two transformation. So, and I'm calling them different names, U and V, because uh, there is two kind of gain equivalent positions. But that doesn't really mean much because this direction doesn't have translation symmetry. So you actually have many different gates. So like all the purple, all the purple points have different gates. And uh, in this uh, special, uh, like in the case of, let's say, SYK thermal state, this is the only a function of t minus t prime. So there is translation is symmetry in time. But this formalism doesn't require that. You can take a general ATT prime matrix and do the whole thing. So in general, these gates are different in both space and time direction. But if you take, let's say, take the simple example of SIK thermal state, then everything only depends on Z. There is translation symmetry in time. Um, so you get these gate angles. And then what do you see in these gate angles? Numerically, if I put in this SIK thermal state, you see, um, the gate angles approach pi over two, exponentially. If you move this way, both theta and phi will approach pi over two. And what does pi over two mean? Pi over two means that means the gate looks like this. Uh, and see, and see. Pi over two means the gate is a swap. This one just about that. So, so, so physically, what happens is this picture. So you have this case, which has which your particle comes from the boundary, and it has some finite probability getting reflected at every node. But once you reach somewhere here, which is like deeper than the thermal lens, then the chance you get reflected is very low. So you just keep going. The evolution of this fermion will become trivial. And this is exactly this is cons consistent with what we expect when you have a thermal state, because you expect the bulk has a horizon. Is a, uh, there is a um, there is a what I call Brighton. Um, so uh, so you start. Where, where did I put the? Uh, so so what so uh, what we start is so the, the interpretation of this phenomenon is if you think about the field the field picture then. From the boundary point of view, there is infinite time from here to the horizon. But actually, there is very little evolution happening right, from somewhere here and the horizon. It's because there is a finite geodesic distance. So this fermion goes into the bulk. And then once you go in a depth, which is like thermal, thermal uh, lens, basically beta, then the evolution of the fermion is almost true. So there is a finite chance you come back here. But the chance you go here and come back here is very low. So, and that's exactly why, uh, like from the boundary point of view, that's saying you give me a decaying correlation function. I try to construct the bulk, the bulk will have this effective path. The path will give me the exponential decay. Any question? 
since your bulk is time independent, you're only constructing the region outside the horizon. Yeah. In the same way as the HKL, we can only do the cultural wave. Uh, okay, so this is just showing the exponential decay, and uh, and then uh, and 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 then now because because this thing basically like after you cross some point the evolution is almost trivial. So even if we are doing like numerics or finite size, we can actually extract what is that horizon mode. It's because it just stays out forever. So so like if you trace back like the mode on the horizon, the mode is exactly on the horizon. Now I, I, I can just write down the wave function of that, but not the wave function, but like linear superposition of the boundary fermion, which it looks like this. It means that you have this blue fermion here will be some linear superposition of the boundary fermion here, 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 here. And it decays in time. So, so that fermion, uh, and, and this, uh, this, uh, this is what we can compare. With uh, with the boundary like with with say uh, uh, a Fermion Hamiltonian in uh, ADS Rindler, if you take the ADS Rindler wedge and then you write down the Fermion Hamiltonian, um, it looks like a, a flat space Fermion in the semi-infinite space with a with a position dependent mass yeah? because this part is conformal invariant. So the conformal factor only comes into the mass term. So it looks like a mass term which decays exponentially near the horizon. And that's exactly what corresponds to this case, which are close to having no coupling between lab and Vandenberg. So we can actually do more quantitative comparison. We can extract from our numerics, we can extract the gate angles, and then, um, and then we ask, okay, if you have a continuous theory with that mass, uh, then within a given uh, space-time regime, how much, uh, like what's the, what's the uh, component like you come, you have a lab more coming in. Right? What is the probability you have a lab more going out? So from that you can compare the two theories. You can compare the two theories, and you see this parameter in the continuous theory, which is the mass times the conformal factor, is just given by the gate angle deviation from tau over two uh, divided by the time parity. So so then uh, the comparison is not perfect, but. Uh, you do get like almost like what do you expect? Like the mass is like one half minus one half or uh, one half minus one over Q for the large Q aspect model. Uh, I don't really know what, why there is an offset, but, but so so this, this is the this is like studying this for different Q or for aspect Q is different Q and then uh, fit the zero temperature like because the, numerically what we get is this. So we can fit that and try to get the mass. And then we can do a non-trivial check, which is take that mass and then compute what is the rigid curvature. Because the rigid curvature um, R over R over M square is just a function of M omega. So that we can just compute from taking that M omega from our numerics and then calculate the second derivative numerically and get this. But then you need an M. If I so now if I take the zero temperature M and put it in this finite temperature formula, I do get a pretty good, um, I get a curvature that's, you see the curvature is like constant negative in the bulk. And there is a little offset, which is probably the same reason as this one. And then near the boundary, when you do this, it doesn't really make sense near the boundary because the gate angle is not close to power two. So this approximation will fail. But qualitatively, you see some kind of curvature divergence near the boundary. Which, which is a consequence that your SVK model coordinate function is like regularized in UV. If you want to reproduce not the conformal field theory like coordinate function, but the regularized version, then you can only do that by having some like curvature divergence near the bound. I think people, I think that you, if you ask the same questions in Euclidean geometry, that's the answer. Okay, so uh, um, a little more comment about the horizon mode. So um, if you think of what they mean, like I, we have using this algorithm, we construct this horizon mode. Um, and what, what, what they mean is that if you take this horizon mode, it anti-commutes 
in the larger limit. And that commutes with everything here. If you, um, if you take another fermion anywhere after this time, that operator and that commutes with this fermion operator. So that means even if you have multiple of them, like as long as this number is the other one, then they effectively commute or an commute depending on the number of fermions. They, um, they, they, they basically don't see that mode. So basically what we are constructing here is like, you have a, you have a system where um, you actually, Actually, like if you measure correlation functions of chi on the boundary, if, if it's finite n, you should be able to detect everything. But once you first take a large n limit, there is some hidden things that you could not detect on the boundary, at least after some time. So, so it's like what is what, what the information is appear to miss appear to be missing uh, is these modes. These modes you throw into the black hole and you can never see them unless you um, you, you go to like other n side of it. So this is saying like, yeah, this, this is telling you how these horizon modes are related to the, the missing um, information. Or you can say it's like protected quantum information which you can put in the black hole. And I want to emphasize like all these, the, the difference from construction before is these are all independent from knowing the bulk, uh, knowing the bulk geometry or dynamics. Like, like we could do this for any theory with the general free field, um, and and uh, generically you expect to see this kind of horizon uh, as long as the two-point function decays in time. Did you have an explicit construction of the infall in mod phi? The infall. Did you have an in construction? Well, only until here. Until here, yes, but not not the inside. Uh... Like we have a, you got me any point here, I think this constructor will tell you what is the definition of the fermion operator there. Well, I was just wondering if you, if you showed some, some formula, say for psi. For psi? Yeah. Like, uh, like. Did you construct it? Oh, uh, I constructed it because of the kernel thing. You find the kernel and psi is k. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, so in particular, like the horizon mode, you can do this numerical, you can find the K numerically, and then you see th these are basically components of K magic. So this is saying if you if you fix the bulk fermion to be here, then it's a linear superposition of boundary fermions this way, but it focuses on it, it will focus on here. I give you you can also do it for the past horizon. Past horizon modes will be fermions. Let's say this past horizon mode will be the fermions here a little bit. Uh, And uh, okay, and and uh, once we define this bulk fermion theory, you don't just know the dynamics in the in the sense of gates. You also know what is the quantum state, right? because on the boundary we have the anti-commutator. We can also compute the commutative commutator matrix. So now you just do the same transformation k, which you already determined from a. Now you do the commutator matrix. You transform it to the bulk. That's the bulk commutator matrix, and that commutator matrix tells you correlation functions of the bulk fermion. So the anti-commutator part just tells you they are, they are fermions, they are, anti, they are canonical fermions. But then like, if you take, give me any fermion state, the fermion state has like equal time correlation function which determines the state. And these equal time correlation functions are basically this commutator matrix. Uh, so, so, so for example, if I give you an interval in the bulk and say, I want to compute the entropy of the bulk fermions in that region. That's completely determined by this, uh, this matrix in that region. Uh, generally, it's determined by equal time correlation functions. Here is just because the, the, the anti commutator is fixed, so it's determined by the commutator part. So you can compute the entropy, and then, uh, for example, you can, you can take a boundary time interval and then map it to the, to the bulk, and it becomes this time interval starting from the boundary to somewhere. And then uh, you will compute that you're going to that linearly growing is, is the size of this region, which at the beginning sounded a little strange to me. But then I think it, it makes sense because basically what happened is you think like when this approach the horizon in the bulk, it's like a finite 
this is finite depth, this is a finite distance, but the UV cutout here is getting smaller and smaller. Because on the boundary, I'm doing this equal time on the boundary by the points. So in the box, it's like more and more point. So the UV cutout decays exponentially, which gives you this linear growth of energy. And that's a uh, uh, qualitatively uh, agrees with our numerics. And th there's, there's something, uh, some other comment I want to say about these horizon modes, uh, which we didn't realize uh, before. So actually after, yeah, um, after we did this work, uh, I talked to Yingfei Gu and then he pointed out that uh, um, these horizon modes, uh, they, in the appendix of the paper, they, uh, Yingfei and Pompei and Alexei, they, um, I think it was two years ago, they, they have this, uh, this uh, horizon mode, which are equivalent to this one. So, so our construction gives you general modes in, the, in this way, but in the particular case where if you push it to the horizon, there is some simplification, and they discuss that in, uh, they discuss these horizon modes in their paper. And one, one interesting thing that the Yongri pointed out to me was that they, if you look at this commutator matrix of the bulk fermion, um, this horizon modes tell you that in that limit, because there is transition symmetry, <laughs> Uh, along the horizon, you can simplify. In that limit, this, the fermion spectrum is very, is totally universal. Like the boundary could be any A, right? But, but the interesting thing is that your boundary, like commutator matrix, you need to kind of divide by the anti commutator in order to go to the Poisson basis. And once you divide that, this ratio is, this is, uh, is for a thermal state. It's totally universal. This is given by the frequency of the boundary time um, and beta. And that's just some, I think that's graduation dissipation theorem. So it, it's anti commutator and commutator has some relation. And it's totally independent from the boundary detail. So what this tells me is that you can, you start from this general boundary theory. Let's say it could be SYK with different temperature. It could even uh, be a different model. Um, but as long as it's a thermal state, then you do this construction and you look at the eigenvalue spectrum of the bulk fermion, which means, which means you're looking, physically you're looking at the bulk, the bulk, like radio density matrix of the fermion, and, and they, they, look, they look bilinear. So that's, that's the entanglement spectrum. And then the statement is that this spectrum is totally universal. It means it's, it, it's the same as a fermion with linear dispersion. Because fermion with linear dispersion, but we'll have um, fermion with linear dispersion. We'll have like fermion number. In general, it's like energy like, like this. And if you have fermion with linear dispersion, then there is there is one um, for each for each momentum there is an energy omega equals to k. So you will get so so if you have a parallel, if you have a like a well fermion in one D, then at finite temperature, um, the eigenvalue spectrum of the thermal state will look like this. And so somehow that's always what you get uh, when you start from the general boundary. But it seems to suggest that, that even if I have discretized the time and so on, uh, uh, near the horizon, you always get this, uh, this uh, one plus one CFT. Um, uh, okay, uh, any questions? Is the reason you, why, why do you need this discretization? Where in the? Uh, I don't know how to do this QR decomposition with continuous here. So, so if, if I, it should be not so, I mean, it doesn't feel like it's so hard a problem, but I don't know how to do that. So, mathematically, if we know how was the analog of QR decomposition in continuum, then I can do that. Okay, so once we have this uh, construction, we can apply it to other cases at the uh, other or general states. But the first thing is let's do it for a thermal flow double state. So in that case, there is there is a, there is no causal connection between the two sides. The, the, the anti commutator will be trivial because so the dynamics is, is separate. So you just need to use the same kernel, the same kernel K we define for each side, and just apply it for two sides separately. You know you get two bulk. And then you can compute things like mutual information between the bulk fermion. And then you see the mutual information grows linearly in time. 
uh, sorry, ground linear in in the uh, in the time window, which means when you go closer and closer to the closer and closer to the middle point, to the horizon, then uh, the mutual information grows linearly, which seems uh, I think that's consistent with uh, with what we expect because of the same reason where the UV cutout is changing. Um, um, but what I see is um, what we we also see like the entropy like the S one two together is growing linearly like this is S one two and this is like S one plus S two so the fact that S one two grows linearly that doesn't seem to agree with the picture in continuum because what you expect in continuum is S one two I think S one two will will saturate to a pulse because S one two because if the whole state is pure it should be equal to the entropy of this small interval. And the small interval, as it shrinks, the UV cutoff is shrinking in the same portion. So it's like a finite ratio. Yeah. I thought you said that, you know, it just factorizes on both sides. Like you have the same peg on the left and the same peg right. on the right. Yeah. So how is there any mutual information? Yeah, so the commentator, the other commentator factor, uh -huh. which means that they are dependent operators. The commentator does not like chi L chi R commutator. This is this is basically because they are commute, so this is basically two of chi L chi R. This is not zero in in in, in the thermal good out state. But I said that as long as S2 does not go to zero means that in the end the state doesn't prove part. Yeah, so I don't know if there's a the problem because of the discretization of time. Uh, or yeah, so I don't have an explanation why that's uh, not true. Maybe it's just a UV uh, because of the uh, the discretization. Um, okay, so we can consider other kind of geometries. Like, uh, uh, so the nice thing for SYK is that we don't just know a particular model. We can, but we also can study. Um, we can study um, a more general couple of models. Um, but, um, so, for example, um, you, can, you can turn on a coupling, um, like a bilinear coupling here, which is uh, um, dependent, and I can, I can add in a delta function for the coupling, and that will be like adding a shock wave. So you can, depending on the sign of the mu, you could add in a positive energy or negative energy shock wave. So let's first look at the positive energy case. So, and and the and the point is that in large field limit you can you can have a for general mu mu of t, you can have a, a solution. Uh, you know the two point function for general uh, coupling mu of t. So, uh, um, so you can see. Um, so what what we uh, we can turn on this mu t and then uh, solve the two point function. Uh, and then just put that one function into this uh, this kernel finding algorithm. So now there is coupling between left and right. So you should do it for both sides together. <coughs> you should you don't don't do it separately in the two sides. It means you you take you just take the whole thing and fold. So you view you view the left and right side as just two flavors. So I can do this for two for one aspect. I can also do it for it's like it with additional flavor in that. Right? So so we can. That is uh, chi L and chi R. Let's call it chi one and two. Uh, chi one and chi two are these two sides, and they are coupled. And then, so we couple them here. So we can just construct the kernel, and then uh, you will see. Indeed, uh, um, there's some qualitative change. I turn on. Let's turn on. Even if I turn on a very small coupling, then you see uh, uh, what happened is the boost symmetry is broken. <laughs> So, so the key difference is like the two-point function between this and this. Previously, it was like as big as between here and here. And now it will be much smaller. And that translates into the bulk picture that the two-point function between these two bulk points um, goes down rather than say the constant. Like when you, when you move these two points in, the two-point function decays. And that when if you calculate the mutual information between the two intervals, is now separate to a finite value rather than diverge. And that's just telling you that the two points never get close to each other. Um, 
and this is yeah so it's, and and of course you can actually see this uh, exponential growth of of the of the effect um, when you start from um, so when when you deviate start deviating from the uh, the original geometry the deviation is exponential growth so we, uh, although everything here is like in the larger limit it's only to one function. Uh, but the, the coupling dependence of the two one function actually probes the four one function, which tells you this diagonal exponent. And you can also turn on the other side of coupling, and that's related to the story about traversable wormhole. Um, so, uh, for example, this uh, this uh, eternal traversable wormhole that when and I uh, studied when when I was here uh, in in the eighteen. Um, so, so then um, there is an interesting question here. Like as I mentioned earlier, the whole construction only works if the matrix A is non-singular. So, what does that mean if the A becomes singular? Right? If it's not positive, that means anything. And that's exactly what happens here. Like if you look at this uh, this Charles or one point geometry, what happens is the two point function now doesn't decay in time anymore. It becomes uh, periodic. So the two point function will like decay and then it uh, come back to one, right? and the left and right to one function is one. Yeah. So, so what that means is if you if you look at the two one function matrix, we have it right there. If you look at the two one function matrix, um, let's say this is the time t uh, t the zero, and this is the tier, tier, period, the uh, half period. Right? Yeah. Then uh, this is one, and this is one, this is one, this is one. And something in the middle is like smaller than one. And this, this <coughs> the matrix can determine zero. Determine that will become zero. And then will, if you keep expanding it, it will stay zero. Uh, because you just start repeating, seeing the same thing twice. So, so that's a uh, case uh, which tells us we can do this construction, but only, but we have to stop here. And, and this is this is a physical because it, it tells me like this this emergent uh, bulk geometry has an end. But in this case, there is a coupling between left and right, so we we don't start from one side. We start from both sides. So it's like you, you think about folding this picture. I think about a, a picture that's like uh, that's like this. Like the, we start from both ends and then go in, and then you. Here, you find that I couldn't go further because I don't have additional like linearly independent things. I, I, this is the end of linearly independent stuff. Yeah. Can you go forward in time outside outside the causal edge? Like this? Yes. Uh, I mean, you could if you just want the bulk fermion definition here, you can just shift the whole thing. But I don't know how you start from. Well, I know, but since you've grown those wedges from both sides and they met in the middle, in bulk, you've got a complete Cauchy surface. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine yeah. being able to do that. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. Uh, like here, I don't want to assume the dynamics of the bulk. So it seems like it's pretty arbitrary. Like I could get there. And if I don't know anything about like time consolidation simulation or anything, you can just put in any gates I want. And that's the same problem that I'm going to, I want to mention in the end. That if I think about black hole, like I have this nice description, we have this uh, description of the horizon mode, but we really don't have any condition that determines the dynamics in the interior. And I guess that's generally true uh, if we are just thinking about like a quantum field theory in the bulk, and right? I can always change the dynamics in the future. So somehow when we think about this gravity theory, uh, the dynamics is, is restricted. And I don't, that's, that's one key question, like why? How do we get this kind of condition around the dynamics? Um, and just to show you some, uh, this is just more fun, but uh, like if I turn on the wormhole for a finite time, uh, I turn on the wormhole for a finite time and I turn it off, which means I have the coupling which holds the, the two boundaries at some finite place, and then I can hold it for any time I like and then release it, and they just go back, become triple. And then uh, in that case, what you see is that um, um, you see well, what is plotted here is like, like the reverse of the kernel, which means how uh, 
Like if I take a boundary fermion here, what's the probability it becomes the bulk fermion uh, at the bulk location? And I think the dark part is like zero, which, which is saying like, which is saying, um, so, so basically this part is like the normal part, like your boundary fermion will become the bulk fermion and bulk fermion lasts forever. And that's like, that's when you hit in the parameter. But then if you send in the particle early enough, you are here. And then the particle never goes into the heart. Particle goes, comes in and then come back to, uh, go to the other side. So since we are starting from both sides, uh, what we'll see is like the particle comes here and got reflected back to the boundary. We're, we're, remember this floating, floating picture. So, so what that means is that your determinant becomes zero in this region. And uh, you should stop your construction. There is this middle part. Uh, okay. So I guess I. Uh, do I? Uh, you can go a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. I will just quickly imagine that there's zero thing, and then. Uh, yeah. So 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 you can generate. So one point is on this construction is. Because it totally didn't, we didn't require uh, ES or conformal symmetry. You can do things totally in, in some very different geometry, like the Cedar. And, and if I consider a, a, a case like the Cedar where you don't have boundary, you can just draw any general line in the bulk. Like you can take a color diamond and draw a line, or more general, in higher dimension, there should be a time like Q. And then you start from there, and then, uh, and then you should do the same construction going, going all, all the words. And then, uh, uh, like in the case of this, there two, we just take this color diamond and solve it so that the middle part looks like uh, looks like a, uh, a boundary. And then, uh, then, then, well, we don't know the model, right? That's the difference from S Y K. But we could kind of reverse engineer. We could compute the, the Cetera two point function, and then regularize it. And so I I don't know why we do this normal regularization, but basically I just did the same thing as S Y K model. I regularize the two point function so that it looks like something you can get from a lattice model. And then, uh, so there are two separate tasks. And one is uh, uh, like we want to find a model which is a generalized SIK, which reproduces this two point function. Two is, um, is if you have this, then can you construct the bulk procedure? The first task that we don't know, we're trying. Um, the second one is like if I start with a regularized two point function and do our construction. The way we reproduce the Cedar. And so you see it, it approximately gives you the right the Cedar space, except this divergence near the boundary in the same way as the SIK. You, you get this positive curvature. So the interesting thing is that the exponential decay is like a, a feature of the horizon. And in both the Cedar and the black hole, you get the decay in the horizon. But in, the, <clears throat> but in one case, you get a positive curvature in the bulk. In the other case, you get a negative curvature. And that's not because of just the internal decay. It's like something about the this first leading leading decay term and the second leading term. There's some something related to that which tells you the bulk has a positive curvature. I don't know what that means physically on the boundary, but at least now we have a place to look, right? We have a we can search for this model which gives you the two-point function. And then of course the next question will be what does a four-point function say? Okay, so uh, uh, I'm almost at the end. I'm just saying uh, uh, so what's the general thing? I mean, the whole thing looks like, like a, looks to me like a baby version of the time like Q theorem that I learned from uh, the recent works of Adam collaborators. Uh, so, I, uh, but I, uh, but but one thing I don't know if that appears in in in, in that uh, work. One 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 thing I want to emphasize is that although you could like if you in QRT you usually assume like you, you already know the dynamics, then you can construct the algebra from this kind of line or this kind of line. Kind of <laughs> but uh, the, uh, in our case, like we want to start from the boundary and we don't know the dynamics of the bulk, then this one, I could do something unitary here without changing coordinate functions along the line. And in this case, generally you can't. So, so it seems that there is some sense, like if I know this direction is unitary, then there is some uh, asymmetry between the two cases. And then the question will be like, Okay, more generally, can you <clears throat> like like naively? I, I couldn't rule out that I could reconstruct the whole time from these two lines. 
because I have I have the commutator, I have the correlation function between them. So so it's not obvious that I couldn't reconstruct the whole thing. So so there is this kind of question about how to construct a, yeah, and how to uh, reconstruct in more general from a more general subregion of the color panel. Okay, so that's the black hole, right? That's the thing I just mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, in general, we don't know how to go to the, the we don't know how to beyond, go beyond the generalized free field limit. This is like what I mentioned earlier, uh, like you, you have mapping between, you can think of this construction as a mapping from uh, the physical, like from the curable space of uh, other one number of particles in the SYP model you know, in the two, a bigger, much bigger curable space of a three fermion in the ball. Right? And this mapping is like one to one preserving norm. If you stay with large n, if you once you go beyond the large n, if you have a finite n, there will be uh, with other n number of particles, it will fail. So then, then uh, can we do something like perturbative uh, HKLL or other uh, ways? Okay. So in summary, um, uh, we were hoping to kind of build this uh, like general way to go from boundary to one function to a bulk geometry. And then uh, there are a lot of open questions. Um, we are also thinking, uh, working on that now, for example, like how do we think about this in a more generic system uh, with hydrodynamics when you don't have a, a general free fields, there may still be something you can do uh, and like the continuous form like that. So thanks very much. When you compute this K, I'm guessing that you don't uh, you have the reparameterization method of the two point function to factor that out. That's a four point function level. Sorry? That, that's at the level of four point function. I mean, that's long range. Uh, so the starting, like in SYK, the starting mode are giving you corrections to the, to the that they give, they give you like an FA format. It also reparameterizes reparameterizes the two point function. Yeah, so like if you are talking about it, let's say in the case when I have a coupling, which the effect of that in low temperature is to introduce a reparameterization. So that's like a classical thing, like you have deform their boundary. But in that case, yeah, I can just take the deform to one function and compute <coughs> the kernel from that. Can you try that? That's like the short way, right? That's one example of that when you turn on the coupling. Is a different one function. So you turn on the other side of the company, you get towards the wrong pole. So you can say these are all examples like that. But we don't need to, but we are doing it in for time temperature. So it's not exactly the, the reparameterization, but these modes correspond to the reparameterization at low temperature. Uh, in final temperature case, um, uh, Yuri and I have this, uh, Yuri Lasky and I have this uh, paper where we show you can actually do a complex value reparameterization. Describe the general. By finite temperature, you mean not in the low temperature? Oh, in the low temperature. Yeah, but if you are talking about fluctuations given by the, the refractization, that's the one I want to correct. Like with the optimal performance that you'll see, right? These are like, that's the one So when you quantize that mode, you have a Hilbert space labeled by points in the bulk. Yeah. So I, I guess I don't have that here. Well, I think if you somehow find a, well, I mean, uh, okay, so you have a discrete scheme, but you had an operator that mapped fermions on the boundary, some space of fermions in the bowl. And um, maybe it's possible to think about that operator as a, It's, yeah. Maybe we can talk about that part. Yeah. So in the ADS case, uh, Z going to zero, like <clears throat> that, that's like standard thinking about it as like a regularization, like, and so it's okay to like, have this like large deviation around there. Um, how do I understand this for the de Sitter case? Uh, if this is just like some world line, 
uh, and I'm going close to that. Why is this like a, a regularization? I, I totally don't know from the point of view of the center. It's just saying like, like yeah, like in the center, because all the lines should be like equivalent, like I, I can start from anywhere. So I don't really have any like physical thing in the center which corresponds to that cutoff. And, and Z same. going to zero is going to that line. This line, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so, but, but I have to regularize it because this two-point function will diverge at, at UV. And then uh, if I think about a zero plus one model, the two-point function goes to one in that limit. So that's why I did that. That's why we did that regularization. Uh, um, yeah, but um, it may not correspond to anything in um, the theta. But I guess actually it's the same thing for ADS. I mean, in ADS, uh, your boundary is not really leaving somewhere at finite ADS location. I mean, if you really put it there, then the two-bound boundary will also diverge. There's also some kind of like imaginary distance from the conformal boundary. <laughs> There are no more questions. Let's thank the Salangi.